Happy Wednesday. So good to see you. Greetings from sunny Austin, Texas. I hope you are doing well. It's back to my favorite meeting of the week, my meeting with you, where we get to pull up a chair and talk to really interesting people and steal all their secrets and copy their homework, which is sort of our favorite thing. Today's guest is no different. Holy moly. I hope you have done your homework on Sarah from Y7. She is one of my dear personal friends. So not only have I done my homework from her on a business side, I feel like I have also done my homework for her on a personal side. But if you did not get a chance to Google stalk her, Number one, don't worry, Google stalk her right now. But if you still didn't get a chance to Google stalk her, I will tell you a little bit about Sarah. But Sarah is an amazing world-class entrepreneur for the yoga studio and fitness brand Y7. You can think about it as like a fun, cool, like clubbing and hip hop meets yoga. It's just, it's a party. It's a party that involves some sweat. That's basically what it is. And she is not only an amazing entrepreneur, she's a mom. She is um, a resource for press. She has been on CNBC, Forbes, Inc., Women's Health, you name it. A press room has probably covered her at some point. She's very Googleable. So the minute you start typing her name and Googling her, this name right here, you will see all the googly things pop up. So. I'm excited for us to sit down and for you to dig in to any questions that you have about growing a business, about the fitness brand, about being an entrepreneur, because holy moly, we are about to learn from one of the best. So wherever you are, I see we have a lot of people coming in from all over the place. Good to see everybody. Um, let us know where you're coming in from and help me in welcoming Sarah to our little coffee chat. Hi. Hi. So good to see you. You too. Oh my gosh. Okay. You just got back from a whirlwind New York trip. We did. On something that was like some big secret project. Are you allowed to tell us what the big secret project was? No. Not yet? I'm under embargo until April 20th. So stay, stay tuned. tuned. I'm very excited. It's a massive, massive... Um, it's a big deal for us at Y7. Um, it's a huge, huge honor to be a part of something. So um, I can't tell you. I want okay, to. wait. Like, yeah, I'm excited because I feel like there is this misconception in entrepreneurship because you've had your business. It's not like you started your business yesterday, but there's, there's this misconception, Correct. I think, in entrepreneurship that um, sort of like once you start, that's the hard part or like, that's the hard new and scary part. And then it's like sunshine, rainbows, chocolate balls for, for the rest of the time. And so I'm curious for you, like when these new exciting opportunities happen, does it transport you back into like those early days of the business? Yeah. Like that same excitement? It's so funny because I, I didn't start this for it to be a business. This was like my side project. This was my passion project. I was working in fashion and I really was looking for, you know, a workout that I could just spend that time with myself, do something good for my body, move the way I wanted to. And I've always been drawn to yoga and I could just never really find a place where I fit in. Um, where I felt like I could fully just kind of let go and like let loose and be myself. So, you know, Y7 was really created for me and I created that space for myself. And so this was never really meant to be a business. So every day that someone is like, oh, I love it. Or I go there. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> Thanks. And it's Hi, still guys. like, you know, it's still every day. It's just still like so fun to be able to hear those comments. But then I think, you know, you're right. Like the hard part is starting, you know, it's always really, really hard to just get started and be like, okay, I'm doing this. I'm taking the steps. I'm like actioning on all these things I've been thinking about. But then once you do that, you have this big moment of like press and you're new and you're like, you know, the hot girl in the bar and everyone's like, oh, who's that? What's she doing? What's going on? And then, you know, a year goes by, two years go by. And so I think the challenging part of having, you know, any kind of consumer facing business is how you're staying relevant. So these opportunities are so important and they're so special every time they come up. 
Well, and I kind of feel like I have this theory that everyone, whether you are a consumer facing business or a service facing business, COVID made everybody basically had to form a whole new company. Like the way we work is different. The way we approach yeah. consumers is different. So it's almost like you had to start a new company again, the same company, but a new company. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it's all, and it's internal and external, right? Because your people are going through stuff. I think everybody went through something in COVID, whether it was like, we realized it was really big or it was like these little things about yourself that you realized or just like dynamics and relationships. And so everyone was going through something. So you had to not only adapt your internal culture to really lead, you know, we hear this all the time, but leading with empathy and understanding about where everyone is at, but also like, okay, this is still a business. We still got to figure out how to bring people in the door, how to like, you know, build community brand recognition, how to do all of these things at the same time. And it was really, really difficult. Um, we're still, you know, we're still like, we're still changing every day. We're still, you know, being really, really malleable about, you know, what our priorities are, where we can go next. Because I think if the last two years taught us anything, it's you, there was no way we could have been prepared for this ever. Yeah. We were bringing more to business. There was no there was no history about this. Well, this could happen. So have this contingency, have this like flood insurance plan. Like what? 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 Well, you had to rethink everything. And I think Jeff brings up a good point here because, and this is like a hot topic in the space right now, but like everyone, I don't know if anybody geeks out and like looks at valuations, but like, I, I think in the next 12 months, we're going to see when people start to raise additional rounds, like there's going to be some down funding. I don't know. That's just my prediction because I think that people have had to fundraise in a new way and not everybody is catching up. Like, I think everything about the business has to pivot from not yeah. only the brick and mortar to the funding. I think it totally has to change. Yeah. I mean, Jeffrey definitely brings up a good point. Like we're in the middle of fundraising right now and it's really difficult because I'm in, an, in a pretty awkward position because this is not a new business. Like I have, I have a successful business pre COVID. We were on a $14 million run rate. Like we were about to do a million dollars in just like straight yoga revenue, like we were crushing it. And so the viability of the business isn't a question, but it's people's fear around not knowing what's going to happen. And I kind of like, as I'm having these conversations, I just want to shake everyone a little bit be like, listen, not only did we survive COVID, we made really good choices. We, you know, shrunk the amount of, we like consolidated our locations. We, you know, rethought how we're doing our team. We added a digital component that's not competing with our in-person, you know, concept. And I can do this again. I already did it. I can just do it better. This Probably time. do it again and do it again. And not only that, do it again, but better. Like exactly. I always tell people, like you, if you've already done the hard part and then you're just like improving on that, it's like, well, I've already done, I've already done the hard part, which is like right. build an accessible business. Now we're yeah, just putting like icing on the cake. Right. And I already did that. So for me, it's like, I, I understand people's fear of just kind of the unknown and we were all kind of thrown for a loop. But again, I did this already. I'm curious, like for Ellen's point, for someone who maybe before COVID was kind of like, okay, entrepreneurship, like I could dip my toe into that, like, or that side hustle could be interesting, but maybe COVID has just like kind of completely freaked them out, to be totally honest. Do you think that now is a good time to start revisiting those sort of like, I had an idea, or would you say to like wait further down the road until maybe things get a little more certain you know i i don't think there's ever like a perfect time you know i think people get lucky with timing i don't think yeah. you know you can plan like nobody is a fortune teller i mean some people are very very spot on with their predictions but it's hard and you never know what's going to happen so i always think like you just have to start and there's an ability to kind of take it slow and you know to change and to 
you know, to pivot as you kind of need to. And that's what happens with every business though. You know, you're always going to be changing. You can't, there's no way that any successful business ever just stays the same, right? You're always changing. You're always adapting. There's always a new generation coming into the market, you know, who has their own money all of a sudden and you have to, we love a Gen Z, don't we? Um, but, <laughs> you know, there's always new people coming into the market. So you're always having to change not only, um, you know, how you're operating, but how you talk about what you do. It's not necessar necessarily saying that you have to change your product or your positioning, but how you talk about it needs to change. Um, and, and I think that's really interesting. So that was my really long way of saying, like, I think, you know, it's a, you just have to kind of go. Well, and I could not agree more about timing. And it's such a soapbox that I get on about stuff because my example that I always give people is look at MySpace, right? Or Friendster. MySpace and Friendster were like pretty much Facebook, but Mark Zuckerberg, it was the right idea at the right time. Like it was just like all the perfect storm. Same thing. Most people don't realize that Lyft was in the market before Uber, yeah. Like Uber just picked up on things at the right time, like timing. I'm so glad you brought that up because you can have the best idea ever, but if it's just not the right time for that idea to flourish, it just won't. It's, it's also like it won't work. And I love the example you gave about like MySpace and Friendster before Facebook, because what Mark Zuckerberg did was he spoke to us because yeah. in 2000, five, four, five, whenever four. it happened, four. I remember I was a junior in high school and I remember all of my friends a year above me getting into college. And the first thing they did with their college emails was get a Facebook. Get a Facebook. And that's what he did. And that's yeah. what I think was so cool about it. MySpace and Friendster were like anyone, but who he right. decided to talk to were the people who already were in these, you know, exclusive places by getting into college, right? By going through the same thing at the same time. You're all freshmen. This is like your incoming class. And like you got to be a part of something and you felt like you were special. Oh, I think the key to any good business, whether, by the way, whether you're a product business or a service business is making that end consumer feel special. If you can make them feel like they're in on the joke or they're part of that secret society or they have this, I mean, I think that that's, that's the secret. Like that's the key to success is making those customers feel like a million bucks. Yeah. And that was like, that was such a cool thing. Like I could not wait to get into college. Like I remember all my friends who got in, like, and obviously I wanted to get into college, but like any of my friends who did like early acceptance got their emails early. And I was like, I was like, what are you doing on Facebook? What is, what's see going on over there? Can I see? What's, what's happening there? Can I see? And it was like, um, it was though. It was really, really like, it was this thing that you wanted to be a part of so badly. And I think that's what made it different, right? And that's what like, that's what you think about when you're bringing a product into market that you see already. Maybe something is there, but you're like, I can do, like, I don't, I can do this better. Like there's room in the marketplace for similar products. You just have to figure out who you're speaking to. Exactly. Who you're speaking to and what they, what they really want, which is, I think sometimes the hardest part. And I love this question from Rachel, which is how did you turn your accidental business into a reality? Yeah. Because sometimes you don't, when it comes to timing or whatever, mm -hmm. things just kind of happen. Right. It's not like you necessarily sat down with a pen and you're like, number one, like start yoga studio, you know? Yeah. So, I, you know, we did this and this is one of the reasons I think there's co-working spaces and shared spaces everywhere now. But when we started back in 20 summer of 2013, New York was really like the only place that had like an abundance of that. So um, he it was my fiance, boyfriend, maybe at the time he's my husband now. But um, he, um, him and I found this really cool, like, kind of like artist loft space. Um, and it was like, I remember this, the space next to us, she was um, a ceramicist. She had her like, that was her little like studio. These were just like 300 square foot rooms. And so when after, we started as a pop-up and someone <laughs> at the pop-up was like, I want to buy a package. And I was like, 
just, we're still working on pricing. If you could just give me your email, like I will, you know, we're just looking for a space and figuring things out, but I'll, I'll, I'll take care of you. Like, just give me your email. And that was all I needed. Like people really wanted to come back. And so after those two weekends of pop-ups, we found this really cool month to month space. It was like, oh my God, I think it was like 1500 bucks a month, which is like, now it's like hilarious looking at like New York yes. rents, it's like 1500 bucks yes. a month. And it like internet, you know, all utilities included, it was like, what a steal. So we, steal. we got that place month to month and it fit about 10 yoga mats max. And we just started running classes. I had um, a 7 a.m. and an 8.15 a.m. and a 7 p.m. and an 8.15 p.m. because I would work the studios before and after work. Um, and that's how we started. We were in that space for about six months before we grew out of it. Um, then we found another bigger month to month space. And this is all in Williamsburg in Brooklyn. And that one fit about 20 people. Um, and we started there. Um, then we had an opportunity. Um, our friends, uh, had a studio, a uh, cycling studio called the monster cycle in, um, in Soho and they did cycling in the basement and they had another room on the ground floor, um, that they weren't using. They were like, do you want to pop up? We said, okay. So I cashed in all my savings bonds. It's like my deposit. Um, I had to like call my parents. I was like, give me my savings bonds. They were like, what? They were like, are you sure about this? And I was like, oh, yeah, it's fine. I need 10 grand. I was like, get them together. Um, and so we, we used that. I paid my like deposit for the space. We could have that for six months. And within like three months, we were sold out there. We were sold out in Williamsburg and we were, I was still working full time. Um, I worked my career in fashion for the first two years of Y7. Um, and as soon as we signed our flat iron location, um, and, you know, Y7 is such an interesting concept. Like we don't need ground floor retail. So we were able to take these really interesting spaces that no one really wanted. Um, so we signed the lease for Flatiron. And I remember working opening week at Flatiron. It was like the first weekend we were open and I was there and I was working the front desk and I had a, a client check in. She goes, wow, they really work you hard here, huh? She's like, I see what every location. And I was like, yeah, I guess. And that was like my kind of cue. I was like, okay, like I I got to figure out like, is this going to be a thing now? Because I was running myself like, I was just running myself ragged. I was opening the studio at like 6.30. I was like doing my nine to five. I was like leaving work right at six. And I was like bolting to a studio and, you know, it was a lot of work. You're doing everything um, yourself. Yeah. You were, you it was, was a ton of work. Show. Yeah. So we opened, um, Flatiron in the beginning of March 2015. I left my job. Um, if anyone worked in fashion, I left my job right after market. Um, so I saw my my brands through market and I left um, right after market um, in mid-March. And my husband Mason left his job um, that August and we decided to do this full time. Like him and I are both in um, account management and sales. So it's, you know, those are not easy things, but things you can jump back into. Um, and the skill set's kind of transferable. So um, that's how it became a real business. But what I think is so interesting and, and really like dovetails on that so well is this point that Scott brings up, because I think people, I have always said that people don't fall in love with products. People fall in love with people. And I think that the story like the story of Y7, the story of you, like people like that, like people gravitate towards that feeling of Sarah is my friend and she started this, even though they might not know you, even though you might be like, kind of like a stranger. Like I tell people all the time that I buy products whose founders, I hear their story and I'm like, well, I want to buy that now, which is kind of like the whole premise of the show Shark Tank, which is like people mm -hmm. see the story and then they're like, okay, I'll buy those Bombas socks or okay, I'll, I'll buy that Scrub Daddy scrub. But it's the same scrub. It's the same scrub that they sell at Whole Foods, but yeah. you fall in love with like the story of like the entrepreneur. And I think 
probably so much of those early day super fans for you, they fell in love with you and they fell in love with the story of Y7. Yeah, I think they're, you know, and I think as we like, we grew and I got to tell my story a little bit more, it really resonated with a lot of people, like what I was looking for. And I think, you know, and this isn't for every yoga studio, this isn't every yoga instructor, but when I was seeking out a yoga class, I wanted to move my body. I wanted to do it in a way that felt like I was getting a workout. Um, I didn't want to feel like when I left class, I had to go to the gym or I had to do something else or like, you know, I was kind of like wasting my time. I wanted it to really feel like I was getting stronger. And I also wanted it to be fun. I don't like working out. No. I always watch your Instagram stories and like you're on a run. I'm like, that's cute, Kim. It's I such a necessary evil. And I just like, I can't do it and I won't do it. So <laughs> I, you know, that's kind of the premise behind like the music and the darkness. It's to take you out of this environment where you feel like you are there just to work out or just to reach this end goal. You're there listening to great music. You're moving your body. And all of these little things I put into place were to kind of trick people into being there for an hour. Because when you look at a class and you're like, an hour, like, it's a lot of time. And I always look at it more like people, you know, you can kind of spend money anywhere. Like, we kind of all do it with our credit cards and things like that. And, like, it's the time thing for me. I'm like, if people are spending their time with me, that's a big deal. So, you know, I think that a lot of people really wanted to and still want to really get into yoga and enjoy that idea and the concept of this mind-body connection, healing, you know, your mental health and also getting stronger physically. Like what could be better? Two birds, one stone, right? Right. But it's such, there's been such a barrier to entry. So many of the classes that I was going to were you know, bright lights, windows, and, you know, these beautiful, tall, thin women. I was like, I'm like, listen, like I've said this to you before, but like, I don't need to ever have a six pack. I don't care. That's like not a goal of mine. Just toned is fine. Don't need to see any definition. But having everybody else around me like that was really intimidating. And I felt like I was always being told to look like the instructor, to look, look at so-and-so in the front row, see how their knee is bent this way, see how their arms are so long, try to be like that. And it was this comparison game that I kept playing with myself. And I left feeling really, really bad at the end of every class. And I didn't want that. So everything we do at Y7 is really to help break down those barriers and have people just come in as they are. I don't care if you can touch your toes. No one comes in being able to touch their toes. You touch your toes and get flexible by doing yoga. It's not a prerequisite. You don't have to know anything. No, I think it's, it's better if you come in with a kind of empty slate and can start from scratch. And you know, I think what will be really curious, I love Giacomo's question here about what do you see as the future of your business field? Because I have a thought on this, but I'm curious for you. I actually think that when it comes to live events and group fitness and all that, we are going to see a massive resurgent. I think that we have all been like by ourselves uh, in our living rooms with our Netflix and chill for like two years. And the pendulum, I think this summer is going to be like the roaring 20s. I think people are going to go nuts. I think it's going to get crazy. But but obviously like I'm not in the ground, like I'm not in the nitty gritty like you are. So what would you say, like what do you think the future of of the fitness kind of field is, is going to have in the next call it 12 months? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that people were drawn to group fitness because it was like, I am with a group of people who are all here for the same reasons. We are, you know, especially like those who come at like that 6 37 AM, like you're there, you're tired, but you're up, you made it, you're here to work and do things. And I, I think that's really important. It's a piece of life that we really, really missed. 
the last like two years. And, you know, I think what I see as the future of fitness is going to be really omni-channel. Um, mm -hmm. I think that it's going to be really hard for a lot of us to give up that 10, 30 minute online workout when we're having those busy days, right? And so I think there needs to be a space for that, but also understand that nothing is going to replace that in-person experience. And that's what we really did about like when we created our online platform is like, I wasn't going to try and replace our in-studio experience. What I want to do is add to it. I want to have those 10 minute like ab burner or the 15 minute like, you know, booty focused kind of flow, things like that, that people know what they're going to get and they can get it done quickly. And so I think there's a space for both. I don't think it's going to be one or the other. I think it's going to be this really beautiful hybrid. Um, and, you know, it's it's funny because as we're fundraising, as we're talking about it, people are like, you're doing too much. I'm like, but it really, it's like, it's all connected. And it's mm -hmm. all going to have an impact on how people start to use and come back to their fitness routines. Well, and I think, you know, as you start to fundraise and think about what this new ecosystem looks like, have you had anything where you're like, oh, I did this this one time before and like now I'm not going to do it again as we like kind of build this 2.0 version of the business? I can't say there's any like one thing like we you know, we ran our business like pretty tightly. So, um, we have just one type of class. We, um, we keep everything pretty, pretty consistent. Um, I think what I have learned though is kind of best practices. So for hiring, you know, like what we're really, really looking for. Sometimes you get those people and you really like them, but you're like, I'm not sure your skill set is what I need, but I really like you. But you're great. Let's go to lunch. Yeah, like you got to go with the skill set because I have been like there have been times I'm like well, it was a bad choice, and I love this person, and now I have to like <laughs> let them go. So I think it's not so much like any decision, you know, one where I you know made a decision was like I won't do that again. I think it's more just you know really understanding what your needs are as a business instead of what your wants are. Everyone Ooh. is looking like, you know, I, I think um, Jeff made a comment earlier that was like, everyone's looking for that unicorn business, right? And wow. he's like, wild ideas in the beginning and all these things that have like all the bells and whistles and, you know, the ping pong tables of the office, if you know what I mean. And, but really like, what is the business need versus right. what do you want? And you always, always, always have to look at the business need because that is what's going to take you further than that like want. Does that make That's sense? Such a good, I think it's such a good point. I think it's also true for anyone, like yeah. just in life. That's such a good differentiator. I hadn't thought about it quite that way before, but really thinking about what do I need in the next you know, phase of this versus what is like a want and, and really getting clear about those two things. Yeah. Like everyone wants, like, you know, right now, like we're, we talk about TikTok a lot. Everyone oh, like yeah. wants like a TikTok, TikTok and like, I want one too, but like, can we like, what are we going to do with that TikTok? Right. So like exactly. what need is it fulfilling, right? Like, so that's kind of the conversations and the way that I'm looking to reframe things as opposed to, you know, we live in this world where new things pop up all the time and we want to be a part of them, right? We don't want to miss out. And so we're so quick to be like, oh, that's such a great idea. I want to do that too. Whereas it, I think what I really learned is that through making decisions like that, like, is it worth it to the business? And what does the business actually need? Totally. Do you, did you find that there was any particular like book or podcast as you, as either a, when you first started the business or B now, as you're like expanding and like scaling the business that you felt like, wow, that had some points in it that really hit. Cause for me, I don't know if you've read this book, but I read the E-Myth 
And that like shocked me to my core. I was like, <gasps> and I've now read it like two or three times. I actually probably need to read it again because I haven't read it in a while, but I am. I'm coming over one. to go. Bar- I'm coming over to borrow it. Yeah. I'm giving it to you. It's such a good book because it, it talks about how you need to be working on the business, not in the business, like in the business, like tinkering around versus like on like the bigger picture. I don't know. It was sort of like aha moment for me, but I'm curious, did you have a book or podcast that you felt like was really that sort of like, oh, wow, that's helping me reframe this. I'm a big, um, which I'm sure a lot of people are. I'm a big Brene Brown fan. Only because yes. I find what happens, I, I try not to read like too many like business things because it gets me into this like trap of comparison. And I think yes. especially with fitness, this is such a new like sector. Like I remember when COVID happened and like all the restaurants band together, you know, with the like National Restaurant Association, it was like, oh, let's get all this bailout money. We didn't have that. We were the last industry to be able to reopen. I was mandated closed by the government for 18 months because it's an unregulated business. Like there is no like health department. Fitness board. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no health department, you know, like coming to check like your food safety temperatures or things like that. Like little does everyone in the world know that like I have fresh air intake and outtake in HVAC systems. We're a heated studio. So of course I have that. I have HEPA filters. I already did. Right. So all of these things that people are like, we're implementing this so we can reopen. I was like, hello, I have it already. I already did that. We control our signups. We don't really allow walk-ins. That's not the kind of business we have. You have to pre-register. So I know Mm -hmm. exactly how many people are walking through my door. I could contact Trace. No problem. You can't tell me that restaurants can do that. They're getting everyone's phone numbers and emails and giving them a call. Like, no. So it was, it's such an interesting, like all that to say, it's like, I, those books just kind of, you know, all those books, while they're wonderful, kind of led me astray because they're not really applicable to what I do specifically. So I really try and focus on kind of what successful leadership looks like at companies who have grown. Because I think one of the easiest ways to you could have a really incredible product but if you have a shitty leader who doesn't know how to delegate who blames who never wants to take responsibility who doesn't listen to their people or their customers or things like that that business is going to implode and it has nothing to do with the product so i really all the kind of things that i focus on are like i read those like i always get them at the airport but um those like 10 minute Harvard business review books. Um, yes. Yes. That are at the store, like how to have difficult conversations, how to, you know, those kinds of things, because I think that is really what's going to make the biggest impact on your business. I did not reinvent yoga. I'm not doing anything different. I didn't invent any special poses. This is not like we're practicing vinyasa. I did not invent that. I'm not <laughs> doing anything brand new. <laughs> So really it's about what we're doing and how we're doing it. Exactly. But I feel like people might look at you to echo your point and say, okay, Sarah didn't invent yoga. She didn't invent a new pose or invent this new flow. How did she have like, for lack of a better word, like the cojones or, or really, I guess the vision that there are lots of places that do yoga how did she listen to like that little voice inside that was like, no, but you're going to do yoga differently or, and, and maybe for anyone that might be thinking like, you know, well, I can't start a water company because there's already 10 water companies or, or just getting into any business area where there's already a lot of people doing that thing. So I learned very early on that people are always going to have something to say. Mm-hmm. And the most frequent comment that we still get are people who are like, this isn't yoga. I'm mm-hmm. like, okay. The more traditional yogis, 
hate on Y7. They love to talk badly about it. And that in itself, like if you want to call yourself a yogi who's been studying for 15 years, is the least yogic thing you could do. So there's that. But also just blinders. Yeah. Blinders, blinders, blinders. There, I knew what I wanted. I, I knew how to do it. I know we have a really, really good product and experience. And this is what we do. And if it's not for you, that is totally okay. Like we have this conversation about olives. Kim doesn't like olives. <laughs> They're gross. They're gross. She hates them. They're and disgusting. I taught myself how to like olives. So I understand. <laughs> Like, they're just not, like, not everything is for everybody, and that's okay. And I, there are so many times where I recommend other studios to people who aren't really vibing with Y7, like, that's fine. If it's not for you, it's not for you, and that is okay. And I think once you realize that, you are able to focus on what's important, which is how are your actual customers who like the product, what do they have to say? How do your employees feel? What do your numbers look like? Who are you talking to? This was never a yoga studio for yoga people. This was the studio for people who were like, looked at yoga and was like, it's not for me. That's not true. Yoga is something that everybody can practice throughout their entire lives. It's how that it has been portrayed to us through physical imaging an imagery that has deterred so many people away from it. Well, and I know, you know, I totally get the whole, like, we, you know, this could not be for you. And if it's not like smell you later, but how do you think about like, that's to get rid of the people that we kind of don't want for the people that you're like, you're my homies, like, you're going to love this. You know, I know once you get to try, you're going to do it. Like, how do you attract the right people, or if you've already attracted them, how do you retain them? How are you like, okay, let's keep the party going over here. Yeah. I think that all has to do with acknowledgement, right. And recognizing those people. Um, we have, you know, kind of internal like rewards programs where Mm. we're acknowledging, you know, a 10, a 10 class, um, you know, the 25, you've hit 25 classes. We're acknowledging those little milestones. You've come every day this week. Like, an important part, I think one of the most important jobs at Y7 is my studio associates. Mm. They are the first person that the client sees when they walk in. They're not walking directly into the yoga room to take class. They are checking in at the front desk. Is this someone who comes every Wednesday at 7 a.m. and you see all the time? Remember their name. Mm Mm-hmm. Remembering somebody's name is massive. That little piece of acknowledgement. And I have a lot of, I love them so much. I have a lot of very young 20s employees, um, a lot of college students who, you know, are working part time. And, um, but, you know, it's eye contact. There's a lot of young, I think, um, and not, not to their fault, but, you know, there's always something else that they've been doing right the phone the the computer checking in it's like take a second look at the person in their eyes and say hello it takes two seconds and that's it like that's what i think the best brands do is that they they invoke a feeling right yeah they invoke a feeling within you and that's what i want i want when someone comes into y7 I want them to immediately be able to drop their shoulders a little bit, be like, I'm, I'm here. I'm home. Like, and it's, it's that kind of thing. And going back to kind of the retaining, it's also having a consistent experience. I think that was one of my biggest frustrations about um, the yoga industry was that there's so many types and there's like all these levels and everyone's, you know, everyone's got a different, like, which is beautiful. It's so expansive. But it made it really hard for me to be loyal or want to stay with one place because I never knew what I was going to get. And that was really tough for me. Or varied from teacher to teacher. Like one teacher is hard, but one teacher is more easy. And I only like that teacher. And yeah. Right. So what was really important for me from the very onset was this idea of consistency. 
When you walk in that room, I don't care if it's 7 a.m. on a Monday, 10 a.m. on a Saturday, 8 p.m. on a Thursday, you know exactly what you are going to get. And yep. that, I think, is a big thing in retaining people, right? Think about your favorite brands, your favorite restaurants, like why you keep going back there. Right. Because you know it's good. You know the yeah. product's good. You know the food is good. You start to build relationships with, you know, the wait staff, the bar staff, whatever it is. It's these little, little things, and they all have to do with human interaction, right? Even if, like, sure. someone has a bad class and they write in and they're like, I don't know what happened. That teacher was terrible. You respond. Say, hey, I'm so sorry. Like, you know, if they're newer, maybe they were having an off day. Have a class. Have a class on us. Exactly. It's all coming down to that customer service. And once again, how you're making that end consumer feel. I think yeah. it's huge when it comes to attracting and retaining. Absolutely. Okay. We're, we're at my favorite part, which is basically where we point blank copy all your homework. Like we oh, just, yeah. you give us the answers, we copy them and then we steal from you in a loving oh, way. Great. Lovingly steal. Okay. What is something that you have started doing or using lately that you are obsessed with? that you're like telling people about, whether it's like, oh, I just started using this app or I just started listening to this podcast or I just bought this popcorn machine. I don't know, but something that you have just become super obsessed with lately. Oh my gosh. I, I'm, I'm really, really bad at this. So I, something that I've been doing actually lately is I, I forget where I read this, but um, I've started getting like fresh air first thing in the morning and like sunlight. Oh. And it's supposed to regulate your system and your nervous system in a way that you are like, you have just a moment outside and in nature. And so I started trying to take my coffee like outside in the morning for like 10 minutes. Oh. And like, I'm not, you know, sometimes I have my phone, sometimes I don't. It just depends. But that has yeah. really kind of set this stage for my day. Okay. I like this because right now it's like 1245 and I have, I realize I have not been outside today. I've only been inside. Kimberly. You, so. you know, and then like the rest of your day gets away from you and you're like, well, it's, yeah, it's seven o'clock now and I have not left my office. So, but I think it's a I nice like way to like sit in the sun, absorb some vitamin D. Like I realize it's not always sunny outside every day, but you yeah. know, just get outside. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you for reaffirming me. Um, yes. It's the sun and the coffee. It's just like, and really like, I know a lot of people keep like gratitude journals and I've tried. Lord help me. I'm just I not. I really did try. I tried hard, but yeah. I think that that, that moment to yourself in the sun like, I always feel so grateful for sunlight. I don't know why. I'm like, oh, it's nice outside. I'm like, oh, this is so great. Maybe it comes from like growing up in the Midwest where it's like cold for eight months out of the year and then being in New York for 10 years. But like, God, the sunshine feels good. Exactly. I Okay, you changed my mind. Yes. Tomorrow, tea outside. Stop. Wow. Tea outside. Yeah. Done. Okay, I have this theory that there is always that saying, like you're the you're the summation of the five people that you spend the most time with. And that's great. But I feel like the new school version of that is you are the summation of like the five accounts also that you spend the most time with, because we're all on our phones, whether it's Instagram or TikTok or Pinterest or what whatever you choose. You are consuming other people's energy and like right. content. So I'm curious if there are two or three or four humans or brands, they could be brands, doesn't even have to be a real person, whose content that you consume that just kind of like lights you up. You're just like, every time you see their content, you're like, yes, this is good. I like this. This is somebody that you guys should either follow or check out. Um, I am obsessed with my friend Ashley's account. She has a beautiful brand called Sunday Forever. 
Um, she makes these gorgeous, like luxurious, like robes. And she just is like all these like bracelets that I wear constantly. Um, these like red string bracelets she makes, it's just a beautiful brand and it's just like her and a small team. And she's so creative and she's so real. Like she's so funny. She does these like proof of life, like stories where she's just like talking and she's like, I don't know what's going on. And like, it just brings me so much joy because I think I get in like the days of like the internet and kind of everyone curating what we want everyone to see, right. um, you know, which is fine, but it's so refreshing to see someone who's like, I haven't showered in a week and I don't know what my own name is right now. And that's just where it is. So she's so wonderful. She's such beautiful product. i like, I just like love supporting her so much. And she's just, I think she's just such a beautiful light. Um, she's a wonderful human being. Oh, I love that. Do you so have epic. like any sort of, I'm curious, because I also have started this theory where I've tried to sign up for like what I am referring to as like happy newsletters in my mm. inbox. Because sometimes I wake up and I get like the inbox scaries. Like I open my phone and I'm like, Rawr! it's like bills and <laughs> clients asking me for stuff. And I'm like, eh. Um, so I'm curious if you have any like newsletters or anything that you subscribe to in your inbox that you just, I guess it could be anything that comes in your inbox really. That's You're going to laugh at me. There's a service called notes from the universe. I love notes from the universe. Mike Julie, like I 100% love notes from the universe. It's the only thing I like subscribe to. That's not like shopping. Yeah. That's it. It's the best. It's the best. They and make me smile so much. Yes. And that's it. That's all I do. Done and done. That's it. Um, okay. What platform do you spend the most time on? Is it Instagram? Is it something else? No, it's Instagram. It's Instagram. Okay. I, I'm working on it, but I don't quite understand TikTok. Yeah. It's tricky. I don't understand how to find things on there. It's, it's a whole, it's a whole, it's a whole, thing. whole, and like, I'm really trying to be better at how much I sp time I spend like on those apps because I have, I have an almost two year old son and I'm really trying to just like, you know, he's going to go to school soon. So I'm just trying to like soak up that like time with him. So it's exactly. going to, you know, yeah. So if people want to follow you, Instagram is kind yes. of where the party's at when it comes to you. Instagram is where the party's at, but I've been really uninspired by it lately, to be honest. Yeah. I hear you. It's, it, it, I have to take like breaks, like yeah. two, three days where it's just like, nada. Yeah. Cause like, I, I feel like there's so much we miss. A hundred percent there is. You know? Yes. So, Cause we're all like this. Yeah, I know. The crazy people. Uh, yeah. Okay. If you could give us all a homework assignment, we love homework, by the way. If Great. you could give us all a homework assignment, so something that you think that we should um, try or do, it could be like eat a certain food or read a certain book or watch a certain TV show or do a breathing exercise. I don't know. But what is one thing that you think all of us should do this week that you just think will make us that much better. Well, I don't know if this will make you better, but I really want to talk to people about it. Um, okay. and I think it's especially relevant for like our discussion. I need everyone to watch We Crashed and just oh, like, yes. I really want to talk about it. Yeah. Because yeah. I am just so, I think especially because We Crashed for everyone who I'm, I'm sure you know, it's the, it's the story of um, Adam Newman and uh, his wife, Rebecca, and we work in the whole saga. And I'm especially fascinated because she was very, very deep in Jiva Mukti, which is a type of yoga. And just like so interesting the way that like she tried to weave in these. I'm just like very fascinated by it. And the way that they almost created like, you know, in the beginning with those camps and like, it's kind of a cult. Yeah. Oh, it, I've been it, knee way, deep in the yeah. WeWork obsession for a long time. And I yeah. am just like. No, no. And by the way, like they're going to be fine. Like WeWork is going to be fine. Like Adam Newman has a fund. Like everything's fine. 
uh, it's like out of how control. did he get people like i'm just fascinated well it's like elizabeth holmes same thing yeah, like so if anyone wants to watch that and like talk to me about it that'd be great i'm gonna start it tonight okay i'll start it tonight i'll start it. i i haven't done it yet i'll start it tonight this great. is good homework. i know there's been a lot of documentaries but like oh my god jared leto and anne hathaway fantastic just <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. I know. I have heard that the show is like crazy. Yes. Like just I mean, yeah. crazy. Like, like you're just like, ah. I'm like cringing and also like you like can't look away. No, it's a it's a car accident. It's yes. an entrepreneurial car accident. Yeah. We yeah. crash. Appropriate. We crash. Everybody done. Oh, Sarah, this has been so wonderful. I love you. Thank you, you so much me. for having coffee with us today and joining us. Thank you for having me. Yay. Um, where should everybody follow you? Where can they keep learning from you and learn about Y7 and this really cool, super secret project? Um, so if you want to follow me, um, Instagram is probably the best place. Um, it's at Sarah, S-A-R-A-H underscore Ayako, A-Y-A-K-O, which is my middle name. Um, and, um, for Y7, everything is at Y7 studio on Instagram. Um, we do so much stuff there. We have some really cool initiatives that we do. Um, we have something we just started, um, this year called artist spotlight, where we're highlighting, um, up and coming artists. Um, we feature their music. So it's a really cool way to kind of discover new artists and things like that. Sarah, I'm working on it would love to come to Dallas. Um, let's talk later. Um, but yeah, we're a lot of exciting things for us, um, in the future and just, you know, trying to get, get everyone back in studio. Oh, I love it. Well, thank you so much, my dear. It was thank so you. good seeing you and everybody else. We will be back here next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Same time, same place. If you would like notes from today's talk, you can go to sendmenotes.com. They will all be sent to your inbox. So thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of the week. Cheers. <laughs>